Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for your patience. We just had a few technical challenges we had to sort through before we got started. Uh, welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. And if you have any questions today, please type them into the Q&A icon located in the bottom toolbar. We will answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to help. Welcome everybody to the uh, June 21st edition of, of Crop Talk. And uh, as uh, things are growing fast and moving along, I thought it would be a, a good time to talk about, uh, you know, looking at the pea crop and seeing what needs to be done before we get into uh, uh, some of the other crops. But it looks like the pea crop is advancing fast and uh, was thinking that we should be looking maybe at some stuff that's going to be happening over the next uh in a week to 10 days here. So uh, to start with, we're going to talk about, a bit about uh, diseases in peas. Uh, Dave Kaminsky is going to be on. And then after that, we're going to uh, flip over and and, uh, and look at uh, some insect issues uh, to watch for as well. And then we'll jump into the crop scouting panel. Uh, Dave is uh, out of province. So what we're going to do is when uh, Dave takes over, I'm also Got a couple of questions for him regarding uh, the, those as well. This way, when we have his connection, we're not going to bounce back and forth. So with that, David, um, I would uh, let you take over the screen and uh, and get into things to look for in peas over the next little while. Okay, thanks, Lionel. Am I coming in okay? Yes, you are. Uh, greetings from Ottawa where it's an hour later than in Manitoba. Um, Lionel asked me to talk about a disease in field peas. I don't know the stage of the crop right now, uh, but I suspect that it's at the point where producers might be uh, considering fungicides or even have already used fungicides. Uh, they're generally used um, at a stage where the crop is just on the verge of flowering. Uh, when Dennis gets on, he can inform me where we're at. Okay, so there are six pathogenic diseases that we need to think about in the pea crop. Uh, the first is the ascochyta complex. Um, we probably refer mostly to microsphergalon. And because of the three members of the complex, uh, this is the one that is the most damaging and can spread the easiest. Uh, we're going to talk about white mold, which you know as sclerotinia, same pathogen that's in canola and many other crops. And I'll talk briefly about downy mildew, uh, not about powdery mildew. There's quite a distinction, and we should never see powdery mildew in the pea crop any longer. Uh, I'll talk about gray mold. Uh, Phanomyces is a root rot that gets a lot of press. Uh, it's a real concern as we expand acreage of field peas in Manitoba. And uh, I'll talk briefly about bacterial blight. So here we go. As I mentioned, there are three species involved in the Aspicita complex. And it's Microsphrella pinodes we're most concerned about because it spreads um, easily on the winds. And it produces sexual spores. Um, Ascochyta is the name for the asexual stage. Um, those kinds of spores spread generally short distances by the action of rain splash. We haven't had a lot of that. Maybe you have in the southwest corner with these uh, scattered thunderstorms that are going through. Um, so microsphrella spreads by wind and it also survives longer on crop residues. Um, the other kind of species, kind of peas eye, and I uh, forget the name of the other one. Um, they're more troublesome when you have a tight rotation because they're primarily residue borne, and as I said, spread short distances. Uh, one of them that causes kind of foot rot can be a problem because it takes out entire plants by choking them off uh, right at the soil surface interface. <coughs> Fungicides can be applied after you're seeing symptoms, uh, so you can follow them from the bottom up. 
And uh, that's why crop scouting is important prior to the application of fungicides, unless you're using uh, prophylax prophylaxis or an insurance uh, philosophy on this disease. Um, this is what Microsphrella looks like on the pea crop. Uh, you can see a pod on the picture on the right. So um, that's a more advanced stage of uh, plant development. But if you see symptoms like that on the lower leaves now, um, you'd better get ready for a fungicide application if you haven't already. Of course, the disease can get onto the pods and cause both a loss of seed within, and if not that, then some staining on the peas. Um, that might be a concern for peas that are used in the edible market uh, process. These two images come from the uh, aging book, Diseases of Field Crops in Canada. It's still the Bible. It was uh, last uh, modified or changed in 2003, but it's currently in the works to update that. But the information about Microsphrella astrocyta it's all relevant today. Sclerotinia sclerotiorum uh, causes white mold in uh, beans, uh, soybeans, essentially all of the leguminous crops. Uh, we call it stem rot in canola. It's usually head rot or stock rot in sunflowers. This is all the same uh, pathogen, the same species. And that's why <clears throat> rotation is not a strategy for controlling sclerotinia. It's also a primitive pathogen. It's highly destructive, especially with pea crop, which is uh, succulent, high in moisture content, and it can splant, uh, spread by plant to plant contact. Maybe that happens less now with uh, semi-leafless varieties that have uh, more of the, what do you call them, stipules that join the plants together and hold them up, you might not get the same kind of uh, movement from plant to plant in that situation. Mentioned that fungicides uh, have to be applied really, um, <clears throat> no, sorry, I talked about prophylaxis, that's applying before you really see symptoms. And that is appropriate in this case, uh, because by the time you see symptoms of sclerotinia, it's too late. Um, you should check the guide to field crop protection for the products that are effective against sclerotinia because um, there is quite a long list that works against the ascochitic complex, but a subset of those are also used and effective and registered uh, against sclerotinia. I had to borrow this uh, picture from a company site in <coughs> Europe. And again, this maybe looks like, unlike peas that we grow here now, in a lodge situation, however, um, you can get this uh, spread through plant to plant contact. You don't need spores for that to happen. Some miscellaneous fungal diseases have gray mold, it has Botrytis cinerea, and like sclerotinia, it has a very wide host range. Um, it's also an opportunistic saprophyte or a necrotroph. So <clears throat> it's there on a dead plant disease tissue, uh, not just of the pea crop. I guess the important thing with field peas is that it can cause blossom blight. <clears throat> so the potential for yield loss before you're even setting pods. Downy Bellevue was seen in a number of cases last year. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Jennifer McComb Thoreau with um, Pulse Growers. She's now in a math league, but she sent me some very fine pictures last year, and I'll show you those in a moment. Um, it's recognized as a fluffy gray growth, primarily on the undersides of leaves and on new growth. So you might not see it if you're just walking through the crop and not getting down into the canopy. It is systemic in nature, uh, can be seed borne, and can result in stunted plants. So here's what it looks like at uh, Jennifer's pictures, showing you the spore production, sporulation on the underside of leaves and on some of the newer growth. 
This isn't a disease that is controlled by fungicides in any way. Um, if you have it in the field, uh, you might talk to uh, your seed provider about uh, how that arrived in your crop. Miscellaneous diseases, whenever we talk about peas, we have to talk about phanomyces because um, as peas move back into Manitoba, it's uh, probably going to be the most yield limiting of the, of the fungal diseases that we deal with. It has uh, very long lived resting spores between six and 10 years, depending on the conditions. So once it's established, you would require a very long rotation interval um, if you want to control it that way. Uh, bacterial blight is a disease that might be mistaken for the aspicitic complex. Uh, I'll show you the symptoms in a moment, and they look very much like those uh, blocky, angular, purplish lesions of uh, microsphelum blight. But the difference is they have this characteristic symptom that as the lesions begin, they're kind of water soaked. It looks like the plant tissue has been squeezed as you might do with your finger and thumb, but on a much smaller basis. Um, and there's also the reflectance or glint off of the leaf surfaces. If you hold them at a particular angle to the sun, that's because of the bacteria that ooze out of the leaves and dry onto the plant surface. Here are our symptoms of bacterial blight. Uh, this is from a couple of years ago, a field that Jason Vaught steered me to. It was actually an intercrop of peas and uh, canola. So it had a pretty dense canopy, um, but this is bacterial blight, not microsphorella. And because it uh, thrives in a moist condition, it does not generally move up into the canopy as much as microsphelum blight would. You often see it being just contained to the, the bottom of the plants. So maybe it's more of a curiosity, but definitely it's not something that is controlled by the use of fungicides. Okay, speaking of fungicides, there is a very long list of products that is registered on field peas. I've kind of excerpted this from a table in uh, the guide to field crop protection. I don't remember the number of the table, it might be number seven, but it's the one that uh, covers a number of the pulse crops. And, um, okay, product names down the side. I've listed some of those, which were the first ones registered. Now there are a number of generic um, alternatives, and that's why in the guide you'll probably find them listed by their active ingredient. We have pages for chlorthalonil, pyroclostrobin, soxystrobin, and proconazole, for instance. Um, in the groups, you can see that there are a number of groups. I've highlighted group 11, which is the strobilurins. That's because used alone, they have the highest probability of um, the fungus developing resistance to the fungicide. Uh, they're very target specific. And in uh, Saskatchewan, they've got real issues controlling um, fungal diseases in lentils, which is the big crop for them because they have resistance to group 11 products. So don't be using those alone. You can see that uh, many of the products, the more recently registered ones especially, are a multi-active uh, mix. Um, they have either a group three with group 11 or group seven with group 11. Um, group threes are the triazoles. Uh, they're generally older products like propicon as um, That's why the name uh, group seven, you're probably familiar with, um, oh, what do we got? Lance, which has boscolid. That's one of the actives there. Um, that is a group seven. And you can see that appears in a number of the combinations. And we even have a product like Miravis Neo, uh, which is a three-way mix. And those um, multiple active mixes are uh, resistance 
mitigation strategy, or they will probably help uh, prolong the development of resistance if it does develop. The two other columns there on the far right are uh, pre-harvest interval, which is pretty important because uh, the peat crop matures quite quickly. And depending on when you've applied your fungicide, you might, might be crowding those lengthy 30-day pre-harvest intervals of, of some of the products. Maximum number of applications. Uh, copper, you can keep spraying it on until the cows come home, but I'm not sure that's effective against anything except perhaps powdery mildew. I mentioned that powdery mildew is not a concern on the peat crop, and that's because of every new variety that comes to the market for registration uh, must be resistant to powdery mildew. It's a very simple dominant gene uh, kind of resistance, and it's easy to uh, put into uh, the genome, so uh, we just don't see powdery mildew. Um, many of the crops have a uh, possibility of using a product twice, and I think that we see that in some pea fields, product being used twice. The ones with the asterisk, they have the warning um, that those must not be sequential applications. Again, a resistance mitigation strategy. Um, but I guess that would mean you're, you might be using three fungicides, and I can't say that would ever be justified economically in the pea crop. So I'll draw it uh, to a close there on uh, pea diseases and control options. And uh, have any questions come through? Or have you had other questions, Lionel? Uh, yeah, there's been uh, one question that came through. Um, you mentioned the second application there just when you were finishing off there. And the question was, um, after first application, how long should a uh, long time period should be before the second application? Uh, many of the labels will say um, the product should be effective for a 10 to 14 day period. And that can have to do with um, sometimes limited upward translocation. So uh, probably no sooner than 10 days after the first, um, but that is to protect um, new growth higher up in the canopy. Okay, and then um, uh, the application of a, of a fungicide, will it have the same, uh, or will it affect this meaning is, uh, is there a uh, product you're using, will it be effective both on Mycosporella and Sclerotinia? Yes, as I mentioned, there are a number of products that are effective on both diseases, um, but I didn't uh, narrow that list down to just those products, and you can use that table, and uh, the two diseases are side by side in the column, so just look for two dots, meaning it's effective against uh, both those diseases. Okay. okay, and then regarding white mold, what is your opinion on the effectiveness of CONTANS, C-O-N-T-A-N-S? Oh, uh, interesting question. Contans is a product that uh, degrades the survival structures, sclerotia, within the soil. And it's not effective in season. <clears throat> it must be applied the year before you're growing a susceptible crop. And that only protects um, for any aphthysia. The, the little mushrooms that shoot off ascospores within the crop. But those ascospores are also easily windblown and can be coming into your field from uh, neighboring crops, probably cereals that were um, previous crop was a susceptible crop. Under barley, um, that's where you're likely to find aphthysia. So, what you do in a field is not uh, going to determine the outcome of, of white mold in that field. 
little okay. bit of a convoluted answer to the question, but I hope that was useful. So, no, it makes sense, David. Uh, I'm going to flip to uh, a couple of the questions that came in for you regarding. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I put together a few slides of the Fusarium head blight risk map, and uh, I was out taking some pictures of winter wheat. So um, there's a picture of winter wheat just starting to head out, as well as a picture. Can you see my screen, David? I can, certainly. Thanks. Okay. okay. So the picture on the right is the head flowering. And um, um, I guess the reason I put this one up is maybe if you could talk a little bit about timing of application. Okay. Yep. Timing is appropriate at the stage illustrated <clears throat> on the left. When the heads are fully emer emerged, but you have not yet seen significant flowering. Um, once you see the anthers chucked out like you do in the image top right. Um, the horse is out of the barn. It's too late. Uh, you're not going to be accomplishing anything. Um, infection has already occurred. If uh, fusarium spores are around and conditions are favorable, we'll talk about those conditions when you show the map. Um, but fungicides provide no curative um control it's it's a preventative kind of thing so it must be applied to the heads when they are fully emerged from the root uh, but have not yet flowered and um, winter wheat there is not a lot of it around uh, but i have talked to at least one grower in the south interlake who is telling me about the development of, of his crop. And it sounded like it is already well on the way to uh, being fully flowered as that illustration on the right. Yeah, and this was a picture in the Southwest that was taken. So I think we're getting to that stage now. So it was kind of, it's amazing how fast it did flower. Uh, you know, you see yep. heads just poking out and then all of a sudden you see heads that are completely flowered. So. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the rapid accumulation of heat units. Uh, if you look at the uh, crop weather report from yesterday, you can see that growing degree days and corn heat units are still way ahead of where they normally are. And that uh, shortens the length of time of uh, specific growth stages. And so, as you said, moving from head out of the boot to fully flowered can maybe take three days, however, normally it might be four to five days. Good. So here's the map uh, from yesterday, David. So I was wanting to, yeah. if you can make some comments regarding the new process we're doing this year. I put a few comments along the side, but I was wanting you to take her away and maybe go through the whole process. Sure. Well, um, we are beginning to use a new model developed by our Timmy Oho and uh, Manasa and Paul Bullock and others. And uh, they've been testing, ground testing this model for three years now. And they're gonna continue that for another three years. Um, they're quite confident that this model uh, is superior to the one that we've now used for, I want to say, coming on to 20 years. Um, the difference is that the old model really estimated relative humidity, which is an important component in disease development, uh, whereas the new model is actually uh, measuring relative humidity over a 14-day period rather than just the seven-day period. Now, you might think, as I did um, last week, it was a bullseye of red on, on Carmen, where I live. And uh, I said, it's dry as a popcorn fart here. I can't imagine that we're having any high relative humidity, um, except maybe for an hour in the nighttime or at dawn when you might get a little bit of dew formation. But I looked together with Timmy at the raw data. And at that time, I saw that um, 
over that 14-day period, we had had 82 hours out of 336 where the relative humidity was above 80%. And that was also coincidental with uh, warm temperatures that are ideal for infection. So with those two factors, the model has to say that the risk is high. Now, unless you have had uh, rain showers as the crop approaches um, the vulnerable stage, you probably won't have many of the spores um, getting airborne and onto the heads within your crop. So when the soil surface is dry to the point of cracking, I think your gut feel is right that the risk is actually lower than the model or the map show. Um, it takes interpretation. I've been talking to uh, a grower uh, in the eastern part of the province uh, in the RM of Alexander, and um, there is exactly the situation I've described that. The surface of the soil is dry to the point of cracking. Um, the crop looks like it's holding on, except on the knolls where it's beginning to drop tillers uh, because of lack of moisture. The rest of the crop um, at its stage is now um, got deep roots, which are tapping into deep moisture, and that can help them uh, grow. And uh, so the crop that this farmer described still had a pretty lush canopy and uh, they were watching the weather because um, there is rain in the forecast now. Um, there were also the possibility of thunder showers, but as you know, um, the kind of rainfall that we've been having are these intense uh, showers, which affect a very small or narrow band of area. You can even in one field have a wet on one side and dry on the other. So it's a weird year, um, but um, I think you can still use this map in combination with your knowledge of, of local conditions. And though I don't have my phone with me here in Ottawa, uh, I'll be back uh, tomorrow. And anyone who has questions about uh, the interpretation, what they're seeing in their area, feel free to uh, call or, or text me and, and we can have a chat about that. Okay, that's good points, David. And uh, I was actually talking to a producer and your comments you just made regarding using this as a tool. He said that he kind of goes out, does his checking, feels what he wants to feel, uh, see and see in the field. And then what he says is he'll sometimes go to the map and see what it says. And that's kind of his tipping point. It kind of tells him, well, you know, maybe I should, or maybe I shouldn't. So uh, I think that's exactly what you're saying. So. Yes. He also asked uh, about uh, being that we can do a modeling for Fusarium, can we do a modeling for Sclerotinia and spraying his canola? Well, it would sure be nice to think that we could. Um, the reason being, as I mentioned, by the time you see symptoms, it's too late. So again, we really have to anticipate the risk for the crop. The unfortunate thing is that it is a field by field situation. And there have been many attempts to come up with a, a predictive model. And so far as I'm aware, uh, none of them have really um, been useful to the point that they are continuing to use them. I would suggest that uh, people who are interested in evaluating risk go to the Canola Council's website where they have a checklist that you can use uh, to tell you the risk in your individual uh, situation. And it of often um, involves uh, not just scouting from the road, but actually walking through your crop at a specific uh, time of day and specific stage. Um, prior to when you might be spraying a fungicide, which is at the earliest 20% bloom. Okay, good. And, uh, oh, and just one more thing. Um, 
I was out in that winter wheat field and we were noticing some uh, whitish marks on the leaf. I didn't get a chance to send that to you, but I was wondering okay. if you might be able to comment on what you see there. I think I can. Um, that is most likely not pathogenic disease. Um, the most likely candidate is the feeding of an insect, um, <clears throat> which rarely reaches economic levels. Um, it's a, a plant bug, a green grass plant bug. And uh, the way it feeds is it has sucking mouth parts, um, like aphids, um, but it sucked the juice out of those whitish areas and we have cell collapse. Um, but again, uh, not economic. In the past, in winter wheat, we had a thing called physiological leaf spot, and the symptoms were something like this. Um, it was related to uh, potassium availability and uh, some varietal um, interaction with that. I haven't seen uh, physiological leaf spot in a long time. Maybe that's because I'm not walking in a lot of winter wheat fields anymore. But if John Goblowski is in the call and listen now, he can maybe talk a little bit about this. I saw it being uh, quite intense. I have uh, oats, barley, and wheat in my plot area for the diagnostic school. And at the three to four leaf stage, there was a ton of this damage. And you could also, in some places, see the black, uh, I guess it's the feces or excrement of, of the insects uh, near these spots, not, not necessarily within those spots, but somewhere else on the leaf. Okay, well, that's going to flow right into uh, our next part of the presentation. And maybe, John, while I'm on this slide, if you maybe want to make a couple comments, and then we'll go into some of the uh, things to watch for in peas. Sure. So Dave's covered this quite well, actually. Uh, it's green grass bug. Um, as Dave mentioned, it's a sap feeder. Um, it's, I'll say, maybe somewhat ligus-like in appearance, but a bit uh, narrower, longer, um, uh, quite green, with reddish antenna. Um, and yeah, the, uh, they will uh, make these very localized white spots on the leaf. In almost all cases, the plants are gonna outgrow this. It would have to be very intense feeding and uh, combined with drought stress for it to really be an issue. But in most cases, uh, it's a bit of early season feeding and the plant will outgrow this. Okay. And I, and I do have some slides I prepared on the peas and the oh, great. Lines. Okay, so we, perfect. So uh, share your screen, John, and take her away. Okay, sure. Okay, can you see things now, Lionel? You bet, perfect, John. Okay, awesome. Okay, so just a bit of a um, um, recap, I guess, of some of the insects in peas that we look for. Uh, I'm gonna actually start with one that's a newer one in Manitoba, something called uh, pea leaf weevil. And it's something that we've had, well, we first found it in Manitoba in 2019. It may have been present prior, but that was the first time it was really found. And we've started to notice the populations increasing. And there's been uh, surveys that have been done since 2019. Um, Manitoba pulse and soybean growers have really been um, instrumental in um, coordinating and getting some of the survey work uh, done. And it's become a provincial survey where we've had quite a few cooperators this year, including a lot of agronomists and uh, many thanks to the people who went out and looked for notches on, on leaves and participated in the survey. Uh, the middle photo actually shows the adult feeding and that's what we survey. Um, the adult weevil 
it will make this little almost semi-circular notch. It looks like someone took a, a hole punch and just started punching little holes in the edges of the leaves. So that's the, the adult feeding notches. That's what we surveyed just to get an idea what the populations are like, relatively speaking. It's not really economical, this leaf feeding. Um, some plants will have a lot of it, but it is usually around the edge. What can be economical is actually the larval feeding. Um, and that's going to be occurring, it's probably starting and will be occurring over the next few weeks. Now, the way the larvae feed, they feed not so much on the roots, but on the, the nodules on the roots. So the, the peas, you've got the nodules with their rhizobium producing nitrogen for the plant. And the pea leaf weevil likes to feed on those nodules as a larva. So that really is what is economical about pea leaf weevil. If you have too much of this feeding and you lose too many nodules, then you end up with nitrogen deficient plants. So they're essentially causing a nitrogen deficiency. So that's why the issue. Um, the weevil itself is, has your typical weevil appearance, I guess. It doesn't have the big snout of some weevils. It's a bit more shorter snout. And it does have uh, these three whitish lines that go down the head and the thorax which uh, can be quite distinctive, but it's a small enough insect that you often do need to either look carefully or use a magnifier to see these. So again, we've been surveying just to try to get a look at what things look like in the province. And um, Ian Kirby with the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers uh, produced this map, uh, which uh, I believe came out just yesterday. Um, and this, um, shows all the data from Manitoba for this year so far. And I know there's a little bit of data yet to be added to the map, but this is what we've got right now. So anything that is this darker green means at those sites, we just didn't see notching. Anything in the lighter green uh, shows a bit of notching. And then of course you go yellow, orange, red, it's more and more intense notching. And uh, that the hot spot seems to be Dauphin to Roblin, that area. Uh, there's a very, um, a, a much heavier population of pea leaf weevil in that region than the other parts of the province. And even when you get into the Swan River Valley, there's, uh, a, seems to be a decent population and some heavier feeding. As you move south into the southwest, it's becoming more and more prevalent, uh, maybe not to the same extent as in that Dauphin to Roblin region, but uh, uh, still um, quite prevalent. And we are finding it further east than we have traditionally. Uh, this year, we did find it in St. Leon. And uh, in a survey that we were doing last week, we found it in the Elm Creek area, not uh, in any big way. That you had to look hard to see the notches there. They were there. Uh, we didn't find any weevils at Elm Creek, but we could see the notching at the St. Leon field, uh, which I think is this one here in the map. We, um, we actually did find uh, pea leaf weevil. So it has spread a bit further um, east than we currently had known. And so maybe I'll, I'll just wrap up the pea leaf weevil part with that. Uh, uh, spraying for the adults doesn't really accomplish a whole lot. Um, control isn't, well, you, you can get okay control. Problem is uh, by the time you see a lot of uh, notching, probably a lot of eggs have been laid. Uh, and there's been research done in Alberta and Saskatchewan that showed that uh, trying to reduce damage with adult control doesn't really accomplish a lot. There are seed treatments available. So areas where with more intense pressure, um, if you think that you've been suffering some losses from this insect over the past year or two, you, you might want to consider one of the seed treatments for next year. And moving on to um, other insects and peas. One that we will be scouting for really soon, I know some people have started looking for already, is aphids in peas, uh, primarily pea aphid. That's the main aphid we see on peas. The ideal time to start your scouting is once uh, roughly half to three quarters of the pea plants are flowering, that's a good time to start your looking. No, no harm in looking earlier, but that's the time to do your assessments 
to make uh, management decisions should you need to be doing some sort of control. And you can do that scouting in one of two ways. You can either take a sweep net and do a set of sweeps, or you can start taking plant tips, roughly about 20 centimeters of plant tips, and give them a shake over something or examine them and try to get a count of how many aphids per plant tip on average. Um, with some of our modern pea varieties, they get to be uh, dense and thick enough that sometimes getting a net through uh, is a challenge. So if sweeping is becoming very difficult in the field, um, then the plant shaking method might be a better way to go. And thresholds based on those assessments, it's two to three aphids per plant tip on average. So if you're in, if you're grabbing four or five plant tips to give them a shake over something, uh, just do the math. It would be, like I said, two to three per tip. So if you've got five of them, just multiply your count to um, get the proper uh, answer. And for sweep net sampling, it's nine to 12 aphids per sweep. So if you've done um, five sweeps, multiply by five. If you've done 10 sweeps, 90 to 120 aphids would be what you would need to be at threshold. And if you are above economic threshold, the ideal time to apply an insecticide would be when you have about half of the plants producing some young pods. Uh, the, the economic damage that they do is actually um, when the pods are still elongating and the seeds are still forming. Uh, too much aphid feeding competes for the phloem sap and you will get smaller seeds and possibly fewer seeds. There's no quality issues. It's strictly fewer seeds, smaller seeds. So that's the damage that they can cause. And so hence you want to be protecting that very early pod development. Once the pods are fully elongated, and you can start to see bumps in them, um, it's probably too late to be for things to be economical. So early pods you need to protect. And just uh, one other insect in grasshop uh, in peas to keep an eye on. Um, peas aren't the favorite food of our pest species of grasshoppers, but they will feed on them. Um, so just something else to keep an eye on. And just a heads up that uh, when we do have warmer than normal springs and early summers, that can lead to a quicker development of a quicker hatch of the eggs and quicker development of the grasshoppers. And we're already starting to see a lot of grasshoppers with wing buds. So the picture on uh, the lower left, you can see buds on the wings of this grasshopper. We call them wing buds, those black things in behind the thorax. Uh, when most of your grasshoppers look like that, probably the hatch is nearly complete. And areas with lots of grasshoppers, if you're thinking of managing them, that's an ideal time to be doing it. Um, also, the, the other effect that a um, hot, dry year can have on uh, grasshopper damage is uh, when we have wetter years, the crops are growing better, but also the natural vegetation around the fields is also growing better. And that usually keeps the grasshoppers in those ditch areas and more naturalized areas longer. When we have uh, regions with drought, um, that can almost force the grasshoppers into the crops a bit earlier because those naturalized areas don't have the same um, quality of vegetation for the grasshoppers. So they will move into the crops a bit earlier. So that's something just to keep an eye on the grasshopper levels. I've had a couple people already this year ask about uh, spraying for the grasshoppers in strips. And um, I know people are doing this anecdotally, saying they're thinking they are getting good results. I've only seen data on this for pastures. That's the only uh, research on this technique. In pastures, it worked great. They were basically treating now. In the pastures, they were using 100 foot um, swaths where they would treat 100 feet, untreat 100, treat, untreat, again, keeping costs down. One th thing you could do is um, for uh, sprayers where you can uh, adjust it so you've got some nozzles on, some off. You could have maybe five or 10 nozzles on, five or 10 off uh, to try to reduce the width of that swath if, if you're targeting juveniles. Um, 
in the end, it's the same amount of insecticide applied, whether you do a hundred foot or a shorter unsprayed uh, area. Um, but the shorter uh, uh, unsprayed areas means you've got less area for the grasshoppers to have to move to get into the treated areas. So uh, something to consider if you're treating grasshoppers, especially if it's in a crop where you're uh, wanting to keep the cost down a bit. And I always do like to mention when I'm talking about grasshoppers that aside from our four pest species, we do have a lot of other grasshoppers like these katydids on the right, which sometimes can be really numerous, uh, especially in the field edges uh, on some of that more naturalized vegetation, but they don't usually invade the crops and do much in the way of damage. So don't get too overly concerned if what you're seeing is mainly katydids, grasshoppers with very long antenna, uh, it's the four pest species that we need to be concerning ourselves over. And if you're not sure, uh, you can send me a photo. I can try to help you figure out what you've got. Um, and just before I wrap up here, I just thought I would mention that uh, diamondback moth traps, this isn't peas, this is canola, but we've got some high ur counts starting to show up in the eastern and the eastern part of the central region. So some of the counts have um, got up, well, above two and even 300. Um, oddly enough, we were finding larvae in the central region over the past uh, week or so. Uh, one of the agronomists, uh, not too far from the Saltona area, said uh, one of their fields that they were finding a lot of larvae in last week, not economical, but they were quite noticeable, the larvae, this week they have trouble finding the larva. And they weren't finding many pupa either, which was really odd. Uh, so I'm not sure what's happening there, if they're, they've completed their first generation or if some natural enemies have maybe been working on that population. So far, no economic populations of diamondback moth, but just something we're keeping an eye on because of some of these higher counts, but more in the Eastern region. And uh, just also one more reminder um, because I'm getting questions on this. Um, Lambda Sihalothrin, that's your Matador silencer, the Bomba Zavada. Um, we, some uses were removed from the label, pastures, sunflowers, some vegetable crops. On crops like canola, flax, cereal crops, um, the, the, the product is still available for use, but just a reminder, and this is important, the crop can't be used as animal feed. So if there's any ambiguity and you're not sure if this crop potentially would be going to the animal feed market, uh, don't use Lambda Sihalothrin. You would have to only use this if you're 100% sure that it's just for human food market, but uh, animal feed, um, don't use this product. I know I've been over this before on Crop Top, but just wanted to reinforce that because again, I get questions on it. So maybe I'll end with that line on if there's any uh, further questions, I can take them. Uh, actually, yeah. The one question that came in was, will grasshoppers go through another cycle where there'll be like another laying or? No, it's a short answer. Grasshoppers are, are um, pest species and actually most of the other species just have one generation per year. So Egg laying all happens uh, later in the summer, August and September. They overwinter as eggs. Eggs hatch from late May through June, and you get the nymph stage to July. And then you're on to adults late July and August. But it's just one cycle per year for all our pest species. So we don't have two generations. So the, the later on when you see some small ones, that's just delayed hatching? Um, yes, correct. Um, uh, yeah, if you some sometimes we do start to see small ones still in late June and even into July, you'll see some small ones. That is just delayed hatching, but no, there's just one cycle per year. Okay, and um, thought that I would put this one up for you, John. I know we've talked about it a bit, but I'm seeing more and more of it in some of the alfalfa fields, and uh, thought it would be maybe something you could just talk about and. Just, uh, I know we've, like I mentioned, we've talked about it, but just to give your opinion on, on what's happening here in these alfalfa fields. Okay, so um, 
in these leaves here, it, it looks like the upper leaves have been shredded a bit. And this is very typical of what alfalfa weevil would do. And so alfalfa weevil, I showed you pea leaf weevil um, earlier. Alfalfa weevil is also a weevil, a bit bigger than pea leaf weevil with a big brown stripe down its uh, back uh, and a bigger snout. And it's actually the larvae that, that do this feeding. They've got the larval stage is green with a white stripe down the back and a black head. So maybe somewhat like a small caterpillar, but they don't have the true legs of a caterpillar or pro legs. They're kind of legless. Um, legless green caterpillar like things, but they are beetle larva and they they like to chew on some of the, the newer um, tissue on alfalfa. Um, so if you're seeing a lot of this and you're worried about the impact, one option, if it's a hay crop, is just to cut a little bit early, uh, the very early flowering stage. Because I mentioned they're legless, they can't move out of the field really. So if you cut the crop and we get some hot, dry weather, uh, they desiccate or starve to death. Now. One thing I would uh, suggest is keep an eye on the regrowth and just see if by chance there's a lot of feeding on that regrowth. Uh, but in most cases, that, that early cut is uh, good enough to control them. And that's often what a lot of people do. It's the cheapest way to deal with alfalfa weevil. Yeah, and uh, I think the, one of the other reasons I put it up is um, uh, a lot of spraying still happening in crop spraying and uh, a lot of beef producers are maybe haven't been taking a close look at their hay stands. And so uh, the calls I've been getting are guys driving by fields and nobody's seeing a whiter tinge on uh, on their alfalfa crops and then walking in and seeing this. So just thought yeah. I'd kind of a heads up for some of those guys that maybe not be looking as much as the dairy quality alfalfa, but just for the, you know, the one cut alfalfa so they don't leave it too long. And good point. Um, scouting is good. Uh, uh, nice to pop into the field occasionally just to have a look because if something like alfalfa weevil is getting out of hand, uh, good to be on, on top of that. Okay, and then uh, one other thing that uh, was out in the field and uh, seen a few of these guys going hanging around and uh, just uh, uh, I think we've all seen them, but I figured it'd be good just to maybe mention what it is and how common they are. So this is a type of blister beetle. This particular species is called Nuttall's blister beetle. And there's actually three species that people are seeing a lot of this year. There's one that's solid black, the black blister beetle. There's one that's more of um, a light gray color, the ash gray blister beetle. And then there's this bright metallic one, the Nuttall's blister beetle. And the first two, the black and the ash gray, we're seeing a lot of those because their larvae are grasshopper egg specialists. That's all they eat is grasshopper eggs. So they're, they've got a good side to them. Um, Nuttles isn't one of the grasshopper egg specialists um, as larvae. All three species will feed to some degree on many crops. They tend to like things that are flowering. So things like alfalfa, um, canola, um, uh, you will see them in crops like soybeans. This one looks like it's probably in a cereal crop. Uh, we don't see them a lot in there, but uh, they, they can be. Uh, they've got very broad um, uh, feeding ranges. They normally don't do enough damage that we would call them a significant pest of most of these crops. And the other thing you'll notice, they tend to um, aggregate where you'll get a big, con uh, a big batch of them in an area of a field, then the rest of the field, you can barely find them. We saw this in our alfalfa plots at the University of Manitoba farm. Um, my student and I were doing some sweeping and my student uh, did her 20 sweeps at one end of the alfalfa, caught uh, several of the, the blister beetles. I swept the other end and um, didn't have any in my sweeps. They, they can be very uh, aggregated. So if you do, happen to stumble across a patch of these in say a canola field or a soybean field or something, don't assume the whole field is like that. Um, it, they, oft, they, they often are very patchy and uh, it looks bad within the patch. You can see the foliation happening, but 
uh, usually it's something you just need to put the blinders on for. And like I said, the black and the gray ones, they've got their good side to them because uh, they're grasshopper egg specialists. Okay, good. Thanks, John. Uh, okay, just uh, mention a few more things before we're done for today. Uh, the uh, uh, field crop production guide is available and uh, we're getting into fungicide spraying season. So I think you need a copy of that just to keep on top of the diseases, the products that are there and, and how to apply them. Uh, Dave made a good comment regarding uh, pre-harvest in intervals. So make sure you check on that with the products you're using as well. Uh, we got some field days that are going to be coming up. Uh, these are our diversification uh, centers. Uh, they're going to be on the 19th, the 25th, the 2nd of August, and the 9th of August. And uh, uh, we actually are going to be having uh, some of the are the uh, um, directors from the uh, the different centers come on on the 5th of July uh, for our crop talk, and they're going to be talking about the different things happening at their centers. Uh, diagnostic school. Um, I'm not going to read through all this, but uh, Marla, if you're on, if you want to give us an update, I think some of our days are filling up. So if you're on, if you can maybe make a comment. Absolutely. Yeah. So we are full on July 5th. Um, we still have a few spots available on July 6th, if anyone's interested, but there's probably about 10 left. Um, and then we still have space uh, the second week. So that would be July 11th to 13th. And how are we doing for the Farmer Day? And Farmer Day registration is coming along nicely too. So again, for any farmers who wish to attend on the 7th, um, the opportunity exists to come for free if you happen to be a member of all three of the commodity associations. So. Um, the commodity associations are each supporting uh, their member growers by paying $25 towards the registration. So if you are a member of all three, you come for free. If you're a member of two of the three, you pay $25. If you're a member of one of the three, you can come and pay $50. So um, we're happy to have people. And I think we're going to leave registration open for a little bit longer on that one. Um, so again, let us know if you want to come uh, for any of the days, whether you're an agronomist or farmer, you just send an email to mbcropschool at gmail.com. And from there, you can uh, let us know what day you want to register for. Okay, good. Thanks, Marla. Uh, the contact information for the crop production extension specialists and uh, there's lots of different things happening out in the field so if you see something happening and need somebody with a second pair of eyes to come and give you a hand and see what's going on definitely contact any one of these people uh, regarding our livestock people there's the contact information for them and uh, if you're seeing stuff happening in your forage crops or you're looking at doing some watering systems or managing your pasture. I think that's going to be a huge thing as we get uh, farther into the year because of the dry conditions. So give these people a call and they can give you some advice and a hand on figuring things out. And our MASC service centers contact information. So uh, if you need information from crop insurance, uh, definitely give these centers a call. Also at the centers that are available are crop production guides. So definitely hit, hit them up for some of that information. And my contact information and Lori's information. So thanks again for attending. I'd like to uh, thank our presenters and see you next week, June the 21st for the next edition of Crop Talk.